So at this point, I'm going to uh, to move in a, another way of presenting the tutorial because I reached a point where it started to become extremely difficult to get in the zone, in the creative zone, while having the uh, recorder on. And um, I, I also wanted to share this with you because uh, creativity is not like a constant process and sometimes uh, events, exter um, external events can occur and prevent uh, to to get in that zone mode where everything is flowing together at the creative level and this is what started to happen for me at this point so what I did after after here I simply worked on this image without recording anything but I kept all of the different files I kept one two three four five six seven eight eight different version of the image and I'm going to go through each of these versions and we are going to look at the different change I made. So it's not going to be real time as I did before, but from now and until the final image that I'm going to, to show you just now. So you can yeah, you can see where we are in the finished image. So here it is. And as you can see, let's flip it. and have everything about the same size. So I'm going to switch between both so you can see the difference. So as you can see, there is not a lot of difference. It's, it's mainly a difference in terms of moods, textures, value adjustments, and you know, making overall the image look more, more like a painting, work more like a painting by working on, on edges. Uh, adding atmosphere and uh, and glue and bloom and a bit of glow and uh, yeah water and so on. So most of the story, most most of the creative part of the of the image is done at this point. And the only difference between this stage and this stage is a lot of different post processing tricks and paint and painting by hand just to add details and texture. So. We are going to go through all these files and I'm going to show you how I get from here to here. So to come back on what I did in the uh, previous time lapse. Um, so basically I I flattened all my file. Just I just try to keep a few iteration of the uh, main steps just in case for example, this one, I can use this this uh, step to get back some um, textures in case I miss some. Um, just a step with the lighting. Depth. So on. And after flattening everything, so I decided to rework my background because even though it was interesting uh, as a composition level uh, on scene 3D and with um, a simple diffuse material which only emphasize the uh, patterns of light and shadows. Once um, I added the different kind of materials and the um, local colors and changing a bit the value with depth uh, it, it wasn't working that good it, there is like some part of the image which started to become difficult to read so for example here for this main character I wanted to reorganize a bit the, uh, the values and, uh, and the dynamic of the shapes just to, to help the reading so this, this is this is mostly what what I call micro composition. So this is really looking at just some part of the image and, and try to focus on all the different shapes at their abstract level. Are working one with another? Is there like some shapes that are attracting too much the attention in case 
they might need to be uh, simplified. And just, yeah, you know, just adding some more interesting S curve, S type of curves to the, to the plants. And um, for example, here it was a bit too much organized. So I decided to break a bit because I wanted the background to be some or a little more chaotic. And I couldn't really obtain that with, uh, with just the 3D. So just repainted everything. So this step was this step, 06. So let's move to the next one, which is step 07. So if I'm going back to the previous step, which is more or less this one. Okay, so I did I did a bit of paint over on this layer, but as you can see, there is not that much difference between the 06 and the 07 at this stage. I just reworked the eyes a bit, changed the value of the fish, and started to add some a bit of color variation on the character and the works. 07. So at this point, it's just basically painting on layers using various adjustment uh, fusion mode, as you saw me doing uh, previously. And I try to simply keep a decent amount of history on different layers in case I need to bring back something. But at this point, I feel pretty confident with my composition because this is the first thing I've, I've been focusing on. So. I feel confident with the structure of the composition, so I don't think I will need to um, move major parts of the image. So mostly the composition work I'm doing at this stage is really micro composition, working on shape separation, adjusting values between different elements so we can read the overall silhouette one way or another. And um, I want to, to uh, show you something which I really like to do and uh, it is to have the values of a given object let's say here is this character which belong to the same space depth wise and but having the values to rotate around the character at the same time as the, as the background value as rotating so for example here we have bright against dark yeah it's mid value but let's say it's dark here we have again a darker value against a shape which is split between a bright value and dark value here if we switch in black and white we have almost the same value between the character and the background and now we have the, the opposite here we have a dark value against a bright background so, and uh, with the other end and it's the opposite, it's bright hand against a dark background. And I think it, it really helps, especially in this image where I wanted everything to be suspended in movement, um, except the final character, which who is kind of winning this collaboration by eating that fish, which is, he is really rooted in the ground, apart from his tongue, which is, which is in movement. But I think having these uh, rotating values help to, uh, to give a sense of, uh, of dynamic to the image. So next, it's exactly what I was saying, I think before. I took one of the, of the previous stage. Maybe it's uh, something like the local stage or, you know, just, just the previous stage probably this one. I think it was the stage paint, paint over here. So I took this stage back and I simply painted in a mask just to bring back a bit of saturation, a bit of the, of the, um, uh, what's the name, the vibrance I had in the previous stage and that I tended to, to lost <clears throat> once I added a, Atmospheric, persp atmospheric perspective. 
and I have absolutely no idea what this layer is doing. It's darkened, so I probably fixed something here. Let's see. Ah, yeah. Okay, it's on the on the child. So I simply darkened. It's it's not that obvious, but as you can see, because I'm compositing my materials using simple fusion mode in Photoshop just to keep the workflow organized. It doesn't allow me to create realistic materials. And, uh, you know, materials like this one will not have, as we can see here, it would not have that bright of a highlight. It's not just possible. So that very bright highlight is actually the result of using this uh, organization of layers I show you before. It's very handy because it allows you to stay very organized and always know where I need to paint something. But at some point it creates like unrealistic materials. So I need to fix that later on by simply painting on top of it. So I, I, I uh, took this uh, highlight down just to have something that look more realistic and more believable. So here, another pass of, um, of mood. And often my, my colors there, as you can see, they really start from something completely awful. I start awful and, uh, and slowly I try to mute my colors down. Generally, I start super saturated and, uh, and slowly uh, I, I try to build, build the mood and the atmosphere. So what do we add in this layer? To different stage. When I'm when I'm moving in this mode, in this uh, paint mode, where I have start to flatten everything, all the groups and the layer I'm I'm making, they are just um, some sort of non-destructive history. I like to keep them for 10, 15, half an hour, just to make sure that in case I'm not happy with what I did after 30 minutes. I can adjust back, but uh, at some point I'm going to flatten this because uh, it's it's still a 8K, I believe, painting. Yeah, so with too many layers, it starts to be to be quite difficult to manage, even with a with a good laptop, which is the case right now, as you can see. I don't have my uh, my. Uh, my uh, energy supply. I'm only on the uh, on the battery, and uh, it lags a little bit. So here I'm lightening. So that's something very important. I'm going to to do a lot, a lot in the in the process, and it is to simplify the values in the shadows. And this, this is something I, I, I like to do a lot. I, I believe this is something that uh, many old masters love to do. This is something that has been very, uh, um, what's the word? Early, the, early the early years of photography and even still now they use this principle a lot to give a graphical look to, uh, to something that is realistic to begin with. So generally, I'm, I'm doing this very slowly because I don't want to destroy my values, but as you can see, it's a simple darken, not light on layer at 20%, you know, with this kind of values, just to simplify a bit the, uh, the texture in the shadow. So something I try to do very often is to keep an eye on my value thanks to the um, histogram. So let's move to luminosity. Okay. And why I like the histogram? I like this histogram because I don't completely trust my eyes. I mean, sometimes, as I explained before, there is this kind of tunnel effect that prevent me from seeing what doesn't work. And uh, I know there is a couple of things that generally make my, my images look very, very bad. And it's to have um, 
too much values in the lower part of the spectrum. So I, I try to avoid to have any blacks at all. So generally, I, 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 to make sure about that, that I'm seeing this, I'm using my histogram to, to make sure that I don't have values is in like the first, you know, eight, 10 percent of the spectrum. And the other thing I try to be careful about is not to crush my highlights. Uh, so it's, it's easy to crush the highlights. And the issue with this is that many screens already crush highlights just to, to make the display more appealing. So in, in a way, they, they already compress, they al already exaggerate the contrast on the image. So to make sure that on, on most display, my highlights aren't going to be completely uh, burned. Uh, I try to, to avoid having too much values also in the top 5%, something like that. So this one is a slight darker layer that I've been applying to the overall image. Same thing, as you can see in the histogram, it's compressing down my entire value range to avoid having too bright highlights. A bit of color balance to very slightly move the, the, the mood toward a, a warmer uh, white point. But it's it's very subtle. I mean, I prefer to do this a couple of times rather than do, doing it too much. Okay, so now it started to become too yellow. So I just wanted to bring back some uh, some magenta purples in the in the highlight. This is why I, I use this soft light layer, right, at eight percent. Same here. I ah yeah. Uh, why did I did that? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, for some reason I, I wanted, generally when, when I'm doing this, it's because I want to put the entire group in another fusion mode. And you can't put the, the group in a different fusion mode if you don't have an opaque layer at the bottom that is going to be used to first compute the result of all the fusion mode on top of these opaque layers. And then next, this information is going to move back to the group. And at that moment, you can assign another fusion mode to that group. So I guess I, I just, I was just in the flow and uh, I see that I adjusted the value just a little bit and added another overlay layer. It's just a fill layer just to slightly move back the mood toward a, a colder white point. Because I generally I tend to love a warm white point. So I, I try to regularly tamper that. Otherwise it's the same thing. It starts to look and you know too yellow to too orangey. It's not super interesting. Okay, so another pa painting trick I use, which is very often, it's, it's just to be a trick to be in the mood, you know, of the painting, not to think too much. So I generally select with my flat layer and my shortcut, I select a part of the image. I'm making a quick adjustment on, you know, focusing on the part I think doesn't work. And then I'm grouping this layer and applying another mask to this layer, to this uh, group. So this allows me to come and paint inside that group to apply the modification just where I want it. And here again, it was a mature of materials. So um, a translucent materials such as a tongue, I don't think it can have such a bright surface because a lot of the energy that reach the tongue is going to scatter inside the, uh, the materials to, to move through it. So we can see a bit of this uh, 
orangey saturated light so I just wanted to fix that. Once again I really try to keep in mind that my materials the way I'm compositing them with this hard light uh, trick I showed you before it doesn't create realistic material so I always need to keep in mind the composition I want to have so I try to first think about the composition my, my, my materials they are here first to serve the purpose of the story uh, and they are not here to serve the purpose of physics it's it's secondary but at some point if something look too far from from reality uh, it starts to attract the attention too much so it does the opposite as the initial intention so when when it happened i try to fix the material so it, it doesn't attract the attention too much okay and here it, i just slowly started to fix try to fix my my works um, at the same time, I really love the very stylized and cartoony shape of the work. They are super, super dynamic. I, I really like that. But later on, I'm going to fix this to bring a little more realism to these works. Because right now, they, they are like too stylized compared to the rest of the image. Yeah. And again, another adjustment. You know, I'm moving a lot between a cold white point and a warm white point because I know this is with the back and forth between the two that I'm slowly managing to build an interesting color scheme. So stage 08 and this stage is, is interesting because something bad happened here and I had a bug, I had a glitch in the uh, recording the saving process of Photoshop, something happened. And I, I actually had two files, two files open at that moment. And both of these files had this uh, very, very weird artifact thing that, that happened. And um, obviously it wasn't present at the moment where I was painting. It, it, I only realized it when I opened the file back, but I quickly fixed it and I'm going to, to show you how later. But, Please bear with me, uh, this is the uh, only, uh, only thing I have. So let's select all this to see where we were. So I think this stage is more or less the same as this one. And seriously, I'm talking to her. Thank you, Siri. Yeah, so this is stage, previous stage, and here I just slowly added variation. So something I do very often because it's really super, super, super handy. I love this feature and it is the blend if feature. So what the blend if does, it, it allows you to create dynamic masking based on the values <coughs> either of the underlying layers or in the main layer here or the current layer and you can you can choose between the uh, the overall uh, uh, value of the under of this uh, information or you can eventually select between red green blue and so on and it's it's super interesting to uh, to make sure it, it's like a dynamic mask so basically if i want to only modify let's say the values here of this fish without having to selecting everything because I don't have a mask, a proper mask and so on and I want to make something very clean, then I can use this feature to isolate some of the values I want to, uh, to modify. And then I can paint in that layer knowing that only this part of the image is going to be modified. Okay, I can show you this very quickly. For example, let's take crazy, crazy color. Okay, and now I'm going to play with this. So, if I'm using this here because it's a, it's a solid color, it's it's not going to do anything unless I'm I'm crossing the threshold of the value of the solid color. But it's interesting if I start to move this one. So, as, as you can see here, we are only considering the uh, absolute 
value of the underlying layers. So it says the underlying layer, but actually it is the sum. It is the sum of all the layers, the layers that are underneath. But it's really, really interesting feature. As I was saying, is I want to make sure to modify only the darker values of the fish. I can make that, and then I can make a rough selection around this and just paint with my hairbrush just to affect the value I want. And you can also decide to only interact and mask based on the red channel. And uh, this is something you have to experiment with because it's going to give different results based on the, uh, the actual composition of your channels in the background. So. And the last very, very interesting feature I want to show you is the ability to create a gradient in your selection. Because as you can see now, it's a threshold. So as soon as I'm passing this threshold, the masking is either on or off, and it's, it's either on one pixel or either off. But now, if I'm holding Alt, and I'm grabbing, I'm grabbing one of these handles, I can start to define a range where I want this to actually operate. So it's, it allows to create really nice selection gradients beforehand. Now I know I could like put this in overlay. It's, it's terrible, but it's just for the purpose of showing you. Grab my airbrush. And, uh, sorry about that. My computer is very, very slow for some reason. Yeah, okay. And only affect, see, the background. And not the fish. So, very, very interesting feature. So next. Sometimes I'm, I'm really doing like some very, very little changes like here. It's, it's very subtle, but it's a bit of texturing by painting. You see, you can see here. It's a bit of texturing here again, again. Generally, when I'm doing like one operation, like transforming something, you know, creating like a texture and wrapping that texture to put it into position, I'm using a different layer. And soon, when it starts to become too heavy for the machine, I'm recording another version, another version of the file, and I'm flattening everything. Um, honestly, I shouldn't do all this versioning, but. Uh, the truth is, even when I'm not recording a tutorial, I tend to do that uh, just because I feel more confident and you know I, I don't I don't fear to flatten layers and it's I think it's very important because at some point working on on one layer and just keeping those layers for non-destructive history for for half an hour also really helped me to to stay creative. Okay, so here the rocks were really too yellow, so I took that saturation dot down. So what you see here is a, is a kind of layer I, I absolutely love. So over the year, I'm, I started to collect a lot of textures, and here there is like only one tenth of the texture I collected over the year. <coughs> Most of these, text, of these textures uh, are from um, from the internet and um, yeah I, I only keep the textures that I, I think are really interesting so it's it's a very quick and easy way to to add texture to something
So here you see just fixing fixing some values that are too dark with a lighter layer here. Some more texturing. So it's it's really a slow build-up process. And at, at that point I, I know my values are totally wrong with these rocks. They are way too contrasty to integrate properly at this stage. But at this moment I'm focusing on the design of the rocks. On, on their texture of design, just to try to keep a balance between that those stylized shapes I had to begin with, and um, and a bit of a, of a more realistic uh, rendering. Okay, so here a bit of over texturing. So I'm going to show you the trick I did here, which is very 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 handy. So. Let's copy merge everything. And this is a trick I come with. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, Photoshop is really a fantastic tool, so I really love it. And it allows to take shortcuts. There is so many ways to achieve the exact same thing in Photoshop. So I just wanted to change a bit of materials and emphasize some of the patterns that were already here. So what I did, I, I did a high pass filter. It was probably stronger than that, maybe something. Yeah, something like that. And there is this other filter that exists since uh, two version of Photoshop, which, which is the camera raw filter. And the camera raw filter have a lot of very powerful tools. And one what I like is the clarity. So the clarity is like a micro contrast tool. So I'm going to add a maximum of clarity, Photoshop wanted. Okay, let's say okay. All right, Control F to do it again, just to repeat the same filter. Now I'm going to have another high pass to de-emphasize some of these uh, hard edges and do this camera raw filter again. Because what I'm looking for is to really exaggerate the uh, local contrast of the texture. And maybe <laughs> Control F once it will be done. Very sorry about, about my computer. My computer is lagging because of, of a question of power. I mean, he has some issues to <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why to move between the uh, the Thunderbolt uh, supply power and uh, and the battery. Okay, it starts to become interesting. So now now that I have this, uh, I can just simply put this in overlay. You now apply a mask, select my fish, and paint inside. Paint and it. Right, but. This is not what I did here. So to make sure I had like very uh, very interesting pattern, I, I using I use this blendy feature again, just to select part of the values that were interesting. Okay, and now I'm free to simply paint into that layer. So this is the this is the idea. Okay, so a bit more texturing. Same trick again. This is the exact same trick I showed you. Here it is. Here are the materials. Same same thing as the material for the for the short 
of the uh, ch of the child, the vest of this dude was totally unrealistic. Unrealistic, yeah. At the uh, material level, and there were like too much contrast. It's started if you only look at the vignette. You know, all these highlights they actually create details point. Because there is a point, there is a, a moment, um, a very um, a, a, a subtle balance to find between contrast, local contrast and details. And there is one moment where the contrast you have between several small shapes with a high density in a part of the image, they start to simply become details all by themselves. Because this is the way I see details. Maybe I, I, I told it already, but for me, detail is simply a high concentration of small shapes with high contrast. And just by doing this, you are creating a detail. And the same high concentration of small shapes with very low contrast becomes a texture. So I try to, like for example here, my texture is too strong, so it, it kind of creates a noise in the rocks. So this is why later I'm going to take down the texture, so it's, it's less distracting. And apart from the materials that, that look unrealistic here, in the uh, thumbnails, there is also that issue that instead of looking at the higher point of contrast, which is the head, now we have several high points of contrast, which can attract the attention. Whereas by simply doing this, now I have like one shape and we understand there is lighting in 3D space so that, that helps the, the shape to turn. But the higher highest point of contrast is the head with the lighting on top of it. So it's easier to know where to look at. Bit of fixing and painting. Also here yeah, I, I fix the, the local values of the character. I really wanted this character to have like kind of an of a 70 look, you know. So here it is for this stage. Let's, let's move to the next one. Stage nine. So here we have like some more dramatic changes and we start to get closer and closer to the final. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove the hidden layers because at the end, we don't care. Okay. And let's try to find just where we were in the stage before. Uh, let's see. Nine. I think it's safe to say that this layer correspond. So this is what I try to do each time I'm recording a new version. I'm flattening everything and I'm only keeping the, the changes from the last file. This way I'm, I'm free to add layers on top of it just to recall my, kind of recall my history. So as I said, here you can see the, the values were very, very too strong, too contrasty. So just to go in the direction of what I've been explaining earlier in this tutorial about how atmospheric perspective works. So I started to occlude the, uh, the darker values. And here a darker layer, just to simplify and stylize the, um, the texture because right now it really looks photographic, but with darker layer and a bit of paint on top of it, it allows to just simplify the texture and it, it starts to move that texture toward a more painterly look. So it's here, it's just um, the initial diffuse renders that I'm bringing back in overlay mode, just to reshape a bit the rocks towards the initial stylization we had, but while keeping a bit of the texture. Okay, so here it's just a bit of texturing, you know, slowly adding a bit of a accident in the background. I have no idea what this layer is doing. Probably nothing. 
Ah uh, yeah, I remember when my computer crashed the previous uh, in the previous stage, stage eight, with the uh, the bug you saw. Uh, I lost some of the work I did, so no big deal. I just brought it back, painting again. Same here. No idea what the hell I've done here. Probably nothing. Okay, here fixing some values. Ah yeah, remember. Okay, okay. Let's have a closer look to try to see what I did. So here apparently I did nothing. Character. Here was the head. Nothing too. Okay. So here I just I just applied um, a simple filter just to help me quickly simplify some of the uh, of the 3D artifacts that were remaining. So you could do it with basically the uh, filter gallery, you know, just by using the filter gallery and combining several of these filters, you know, Vitor Spatter, for example, with a, a bit of, of um, palette knife. It does the kind of the same result. So here I use another another filter, which is a Topaz Labs uh, Simplify 4. But uh, it's just that I have my preset in here, so I like to use it. But you can do any way you want. Yeah, just just adding quickly eyes to have an idea of how the frog is going to. To appear with a, a decent uh, look, and now post. And I, I really love this this posting uh, part. I, th I think a, a lot of the mood of the image comes from the post processing, and it's all very simple tricks. So I, as I said before, I try to always simplify my darker values. When I say simplify, it's it just remove basically some. Of the uh, of the texture work by either adding a latent layer or, or tweaking uh, you know the, the contrast with a with a, a level layer or a curve layer. The idea is the same. So after that, I, I'm bringing back a bit of dynamism because here we lost a lot of that, of that dynamic. So let me bring my histogram again. So before, after. So as you can see, the, there is a slightly shift of the overall value range towards the, the top of the spectrum. And this is because I want this image to look like it's been captured with a lot of sun. So I want it to be a bit brighter than when I, what I usually do without having too much dark values. But the challenge with that is without dark values, you still need to have an interesting contrast and, and gamma curve to make uh, the, the image look, uh, you know, not, not flat and just uh, washed away. So this is why, what I'm trying to, to achieve. Then I will, I will modify this a couple of times. So yeah, here it's 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 a bit of noise. So it's a, it's a simple noise, but once again, just noise applied overall on the image doesn't look that great. So I try to build up my my noise in uh, in stages, and this one, as you can see, have a big gradient. You can see it here. It has a big, big gradient that starts from the bottom of the spectrum up to the top of the spectrum. So if I'm moving this down, we slowly will slowly have the, the the noise that is going to disappear. So this way, it allows me to create a noise pass that is going to affect more the darker values than the highlights. So as you can see here, there is almost 
no noise here in the highlights but here we, we can see the noise is affecting this part here a lot more you can see and it really helps to to play with both this painterly and this photographic language because this is typical of photography where the camera have more difficulty to process the information where when there is not enough light so it starts to create either a, a, um, a chemical noise or a, a digital noise so another kind of noise so now this one what have i done here okay so this one is really affecting as you can see it's the same idea it starts the gradient starts from the very bottom of the spectrum and it stops very early so what it does is it only impacts the darker values and it helps me to have a noise which looks more organic because now the type of noise we are going to have in our mid values will be this one but in the darker values we have another type of noise so there is like a slightly shift in the nature of the noise and here this is the complementary noise this is this is one which is going to do the opposite which is affecting mainly i believe the top of the spectrum here it is you can see if i'm moving this slider here is my other slider for this for this layer which means that my gradient is going to go from the darker values to the higher values so basically i won't have this this noise in the dark which which again is, is something i try to do to emulate the way a camera either digital or anything will affect the values and the details of, of the image it captures So this noise here was created using filter, camera or filter, which has a very nice module. I, I really like the, the noise you can have in, a, in camera row. It's in FX grain. Uh, it's just a 50% gray, which I put an overlay and, and use this filter on top of it. This one is a filter I created myself and uh, it's difficult to see but it is simply I'm going to remove these settings here so you can see it it's just a noise I created using like several of this combination of noise I show you before and processing cross-processing different type of noise one with another Okay, this one is the classical noise you have is in here, noise add noise. And uh, I really like this filter because it can create, actually, if you select the, you uncheck monochromatic and select the Gaussian, it, it creates a very interesting type of noise. And a slight, once again, slight color balance, which I believe also affects Unlow the top of the spectrum. So as you can see here again, I added my gradient from the very bottom of the spectrum to the higher part, which means that it's going to affect less and less and less darker values. So I do this because there is not really one filter in Photoshop that that we can call white point. You know, like you you'll find if you are doing photography, there is always a way to adjust the uh, the white point balance temperature. So this is all I, I'm I'm trying to do it in Photoshop. Okay, we are really 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 close to the final now. Stage ten. Stage ten is going to be, I believe, mostly about painterliness. Um, here, if I'm moving back in time, I think I should find something. Yeah, something like that. So, 
this is the preview stage, which I'm going to group. Let's call it stage online. And in the post processing, I haven't changed anything, I believe. So it's still the same. And what I really, really like about having this post processing stage before the final of the image is that it allows me to paint with this group on. So I'm really painting in the condition of the final uh, image look. And it really simplifies my, my, um, my work because thanks to this layer, you can see that there is a lot of information that are, that are going to go away, especially in the shadows. So it prevents me from you know, just messing around in part of the image that, that are not going to be effective at the end. So here, the values were like too, too clustered. I don't really like the, the look. So I just brought back a bit of details from the diffuse path, lightening a bit everything so it's more consistent with the material of the jaw. So I'm trying to add some, a bit of a, of bouncing light from the tone all over the place. And now this is one of my favorite stage, which is painting over, just painting over and go all around the place and try to fix the image to make it look just more like a, like a painting. So trying to zoom in at this stage. No. I'm using a combination of two main tools and it is the standard brush and the mixer brush. And the way I'm using the mixer brush, it's, it's very easy and very effective. I'm going to show you this. So I'm going to remove my post, remove this, and I'm going to copy merge everything. Now that I have this copy merge, I'm going to take the fill here and put it down to 1% fill. So I was discussing the other day with, uh, with uh, a specialist at Adobe in a convention and he explained me that he never really knows if it was a bug to begin with that, that Adobe decided to keep or if it was a feature, but it is very, very, very uh, useful. So the idea with the fill 1% is that you, you don't have any visible information in this layer, but actually you still have a 100% pixel opacity that are filled in this image. It's just that you can see it. And now I'm going to create another layer under this, and I'm going to merge down this layer with my underneath layer. Okay, so now we have a layer that doesn't look like it contains anything, but it has actually a 1% fill of pixel data. Now I'm going to grab a mixer brush. It says this one. And I'm going to remove the report on this sample all layers. Okay, so you can, you can have a look at the settings I have here. It's very simple. You can grab basically any dab you like in your, in your current uh, brush set. All of them will have a different behavior. And now, anywhere I'm painting, the mixer brush is going to sample from this 1% field data, which exists in this layer and it will turn it into a 100% fill data, which is going to allow us to see what is actually happening. So this is super handy because, especially for taking care of edges and slowly turning the image into, into a painting, it really gives beautiful results. You can 
easily blur edges break straight edges simplify textures uh, the thing is it can also look quite uh, easily cheesy uh, like a bit bubblegum so there is like a very subtle balance to find because overdoing it is going to look terrible so i'm really trying generally to focus on the main edges that are attracting too much the attention i'm just trying to, to fix them and simplify texture when I, where i need so obviously if i change my dab i'm going to have a different behavior so some dabs sorry about that some dabs will be more um, interesting for simplifying texture for example this one because it have a, a slow build up into it for example here i <coughs> can remove the the uh, 3d look here I'm doing this Oh, well, you have to be careful because it, it still creates some artifacts with some dabs, it, it really depends, so sometimes I'm, I'm just switching to another dab because it creates those weird artifacts that are not super interesting. Uh, I'm trying always to de-emphasize de the edges that are going toward the border of the frame to avoid the, the eye to the gaze to go out, we can simplify the water. Yeah, really, it's, it's a super interesting tool. Very useful. So, this is the idea. So, here's what I did using this exact same principle. Here I simply copy, merge this part of the image, flip it horizontally and, and added um, a motion blur, a vertical motion blur. So this helped me to create a pass. Here it is, a reflection pass, which I could use to suggest a bit more of the shift in value that is going to occur with um, a natural uh, reflection and now it looks super fake so I'm fixing this uh, slowly using different painting and uh, and mixer brush tricks I've shown you before and here's my post process group on top of everything so uh, just keep in mind that actually when I was working on that I had this post process layer activated so everything I'm judging about whether I'm doing things right or not is based on this layer, on this, on this group being on. This way, I, I'm going to refrain to add details in here because this is, per design, this is an area of rest. So this is something really interesting to implement in composition. This is this idea of resting area. Because when an image have like textures everywhere, small shapes everywhere that the eye can spot, it starts to become extremely difficult for the for the vision to decide where to look and where to spend time. And this is why I like these simplifications of value uh, with a post processing layer. It's because it creates this really nice and interesting resting area where there is absolutely no details just a perfect flat, flat shape. Here I see almost almost flat shape. Here we have flat shape here. Kind of a flat gradient type of shape here. And same with the background here on the board too. And the, uh, the umbrella, it helps a lot. Okay, so stage 11. As you can see, I, I keep flipping my image from right to left and left to right very often. Um, it's it's a, a very useful trick, I believe, like every illustrator and concept artist I know of use uh, to simply help to uh, get rid of this uh, 
this tunnel effect and bring a fresh look on the image once in a while. So now I decided to group everything into a paint over a group PO. And to try to find out where I was before. And I think it was like maybe here. So about this cheesy look of the mixer brush, here's an example of what I was talking about. The mixer brush tends to give this very weird cheesy look because it, it's very difficult to have straight edge with the mixer brush and um, the contrast between something that has been created from photographic materials and something that has been blended with this mixer brush gives some give a result which is a bit yeah what I call cheesy. It's not it's not really I don't know aesthetic. It, it doesn't work. So here I, I try to bring back with various textures and and painting tricks. I try to bring back uh, a bit of a of a coherence to the brushwork I suggest with these tricks because it's it's all about suggesting brushwork. And so all of these layers, I believe, are about the works that I was trying to fix. And here, so here I decided first to simplify, as you can see, a bit, a bit more the value, but it was a bit too much. So I decided to add this final texture pass on top of everything. So it's simply uh, a texture. I know it was like a random rock, rock I, I, I liked and uh, this work I put it on darken and by simply playing with the level it's, uh, it's easy to, to decide which part of the texture you want to, uh, to actually appear. So I only brought back the very lower part of the spectrum of this file just to keep a graphical language to the texture. Yeah, this is a lot of <laughs> brainstorming for just a couple of rocks. I, I agree. Maybe you guys uh, would have painted this in a more, much more efficient way than I, I did. So anyway, so this is splashing. So let's have a look at the splash. So I started by simply importing couple refer reference images. So these are like dolphin, jumping dolphin. And uh, for some reason we are normal. I don't have mask. Okay. Pass through, normal. Okay. What? Well. So the same texture I applied in front, simply to get a sense of depth. So in this one, I tried to select only the, some part of the image by uh, messing around with, you know, it's on Lighten, so simply by messing around with the value. Once again, doing this, moving the midpoints, it's easier to decide just which part of the, of the texture you want to appear. Okay, so here I'm shifting a bit the saturation because it was too saturated toward a cyan, a strong cyan blue. I'm taking down the values so it's not too too powerful. And after that, it's just uh, yeah. So painting on top of everything with a with a custom brush. Here again. And now I have like simply paint, you know, with, with, with various brushes. So 
when I'm doing this, I, I try to, to look at references, obviously. But in that, in that part of the process, I was looking at uh, the painter really. To write that because well, many of you probably know his work. He is a fantastic oil painter because he had a very specific way of stylizing uh, splashes that I really like. So I'm extremely far, far, far from being able to stylize like he do, but I try to grab some elements of language from his painting. And the rest is just a bit of blending. So this is a bit of sharpening here. Painting on top of it again. Smudging. Adding some um, airbrush strokes with a bit of noise. Just a simple airbrush with a, a noise texture applied to it. Slightly bit of blur and a bit of blur again. So here's a splash. And as far as the paint over is concerned, I think I didn't change anything apart from maybe this use duration layer. Uh, because I know I tend to work too much saturated, so I often, and it's going to be especially, I think, exaggerated in the video because the way Camtasia records the video, I notice that generally the, the image appears um, much more saturated than they are. But anyway, you'll have the final to, to see by yourself and the, and the files. So apart from this, everything is the same settings that I had in the previous stages. So stage 12, now it's really about post-processing mostly, and there is like very, very little painting. Let's see. I'm going to delete hidden layers and just from memory here's a splash so this is where we were in stage 11 and stage 12 it's trying to fix things there and there to move into full screen with only my lay layers palette so trying to create a more realistic texture for the rocks because this rocks looks super flat but later i'm going to fix this again because it looks super weird yeah so adding a bit of contrast here again just working on the contrast of, of the shapes so they read better at very small sizes this is something i try to keep in mind all the time just to make sure that things are reading at this size and this is very important because A, it's a very powerful composition checking trick. If you can't read the image at this side, at this size, then there is very little chance that your composition is going to work at bigger size. And secondly, because in today's streams of information and and huge amount of image that we are all seeing on Instagram, our station, Facebook, all the time. Having a strong thumbnails is super important if you want to um, instant. It's, it's, an, it's an incentive, basically, for people to click on your image and, and know more about it. You know, most of the time, it's going to be a simple square. Uh, if people visit your profile on, on uh, our station or on Instagram, so if you want them to click on it, you need to have a strong thumbnail. So these are very, very, very small fixes. So here I decided, okay, okay this, is, this is terrible. So I just brought back my initial texture and just trying to do something about it. 
Uh, I have to say I'm, I, I'm still not happy at all with this work, but you know, it's just a small part of the image. It's not something that contribute to excessively tell something about the story and uh, it's not too contrasty, it doesn't prevent or attract too much the, the attention. So there is always a point, I think, in an image where you're not to be, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're not going to love something about this image and you just can't fix everything. We, we yeah, I mean, we are not going masterpieces. It's, it's frustration. And if you start to think of fixing all the time, every, every, every new thing that you are spotting, uh, you are going to work forever until it's the end of your life on a piece. So the glow part, I love glow. Once again, it's a, it's an important part of a, of post processing for me to really help bring that sensation of light that is captured through a camera. So glow basically is a very small and subtle process of of adding. I'm going to show you after of adding several layers of of blurring uh, with very very low. You can see seven percent. 25%, 25, 26, and the group itself is only at 50% of values. So for the glow, I'm, I'm selecting everywhere, Control A, Control Mage C, to copy everything, Control Mage V, right, so now I have like a merged copy of this, and I'm simply going to prepare a selection of value, knowing that because I'm going to use blending modes such as screen, uh, color dodge, linear dodge, or things like that, uh, which are already selecting and, and by themselves masking a part of the image. So I'm trying to, to see that as a, some sort of a, let's put it on top of everything, of, of some sort of, of masking. Everything that is black, is going to be mask, masked out. So the question is, what do we, I want? Which part of the image contains so much, receives so much and wounds so much light that it is going to create a glow? And to understand what a glow is, a glow is not something generally that happens in the, in the physical world. It can happen in the physical world if there is like a lot of moisture uh, in the atmosphere because uh, the, the small uh, what's the word in drop, so these small drops, these small particles of water, they are going to catch like a prism, a bit of the bouncing light of a very bright object that receives a lot of the sun, and it's going to diffract this light around the object in the atmosphere. But there is like very little case where you're going to have a glow that happens at the physical world. Most of the time, the glow is happening either in the eye or in the lens. And this is when a lens receives so much light that the rays that enter the lens start to diffract, uh, change their direction when they pass through the different uh, layers of, uh, of glass, the different lenses. So it, the same thing happened in the corona, I believe. So there is also glow that you can observe with your eye, but this is, this is something that happened inside the eye itself. So the question is, which part of this image is going to receive so much light that it's going to create a glow in my eye? All right, so let's, let's say, okay, I'm going to do this selection. Now I'm going to blur this filter. Blur. Let's start with a very small, a very subtle blur. Just a few pixels around and put this like on screen mode and really take it down. And the next one, I'm going to duplicate it and simply change the size of the blur. 
and sometimes I can mess around with this uh, balance, midpoint balance. And that's all that, th this is what I did here. So. And where there is always a point where this process is going to screw with the initial values. So this is why here I decided to mask out a bit of this splash because it, it started to become so bright that it was the center of it of attention and I, I didn't want that. So it, as you can see it's 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 subtle but it makes a difference. Often I see people implementing glow in their image but the, the issue is that they do basically one layer with very large radius of blur. And what it does is it's it really transform the image into a giant bubblegum of values and colors and it destroys everything so this is why I think it's important to really slowly very slowly build up the glow deciding exactly which part of the image you want to use to suggest the intensity of the light because you don't need to be photo real or to to obey to the law of physics you can you can simply suggest this physical elements and it doesn't need that much to suggest them and final file final step step 13 so when i'm moving very close very very close to the end of the image i'm generally creating this post file and i'm using the um, smart object uh, capability of photoshop to reference my final file or almost final. So here what I did, I just did this control A, control mash C. So basically I'm copying the image, control N, I'm going to create a new image, create, control V, flattening everything. And now on this background, I'm going to do a convert to smart object. And now that I've done that, I can simply say, okay, I want to relink, relink this smart object to a file. So I simply selected the, the proper file and you, you see that now it renamed it. Uh, at that moment, this tutorial was intended to cover narrative illustration, the second part, so this is why it called, it's called like that. Uh, and if I'm double clicking on it here, you'll see that it's, go it's going to open me the, the file in question. So this is what I did for this file here. Okay, so I'm going to close that one. It was just to show you the process. Okay, so now what is very interesting about this is that here I just have a simple camera raw post-processing filter, but you can add as many post-processing filters you want on this smart object. And each time you have the both of this file open and that you're going to save this file, it's going to automatically update this one. So it's very convenient because I think post-processing is especially a destructive post-processing like like sharpening and uh, you know subtle lens effects uh, or if you want to add you know a bit of lens correction or just to, to give a bit more of a of a photographic look to your image to your illustration if you have to redo this each time you do a change because you, you realize that something doesn't work in the image and you, know, you want to fix this eye, for example, you have to redo the post-processing all from the beginning. So you could record an action, but same thing for the actions. What if suddenly you simply want to change the opacity of this filter? And thanks to, to these smart filters, you can simply double click on this icon and decide, okay, I want this filter here, but I only want it to blend with a 70% uh, ratio. So it's really, really super, super convenient. So what have, have I done in here? So I added, I believe, 
this layer, maybe what the hell. No, I think this is all. I just fixed. Okay, I fixed the values. This, I think this is something that wasn't in the previous version. And here this is noise again. Depth of field. Okay, so I see, I see that I did quite a lot of, of editing actually. Okay, yeah. So it's been a decent amount of work in here. So I'm going to get back to my original version. Delete hidden layer to make sure I'm not activating layer that wasn't here in the first place. Uh, and I see that everything is flattened. So I would say this is where I was when I left this previous stage. So the file started to be too heavy, so I decided to to simply flatten everything. So as you can see, there is a lot of just manual painting, simply fixing things around, trying to imply more details or you know make things a bit more interesting there and there. And these final touches on an illustration, this is really when, like for example, if I was only listening to my to my really instinct who want to just publish something, you know, just to to, to publish it because that way it's done. Uh, I would have like posted it maybe at stage 10 or 11. But I think this this just couple hours that you are put, putting after that moment just can make a big difference. And sometimes just to wait like one day after, you know, you wait 24 hours just to let your, your eye refresh. And when you come back to your image, there, there is a lot of things that wasn't working for you and that you are able to see all by yourself. So in a way you are kind of art directing your, your own work when you're doing, doing this. So this is something I almost never do in my images, and this is to add depth of field. Generally, I don't. I, I simply use uh, painting tricks to suggest um, a simplification of details going to the background. But I thought that here it would be really, really adapted to use that. So I decided to to simply do a depth of field pass. And um, I used the previous map I had to begin with. And using a combination of this map and selecting my background, I created this specific map that was exactly matching my scene. And to do this, I simply use this, this uh, function which is called color range. So I have a shortcut for this, but it's probably in uh, image adjustment. I don't know. Maybe in select. Yeah, select color range. So, and I selected the blue component of the background because I knew that the farther with the distance, the bluer the 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 color. This is what I have been doing to create my depth of field. So my depth, my atmospheric depth. So it, it was easy to get back this depth using this. So I did a selection and using this selection, I duplicated my, my first depth I had like that. And I simply decided to fix, kind of fix the background. Uh, Way. So it's interesting to try to remember. Oh, I did this. I'm going to make a copy. Here it is. I'm going to select the foreground and fill it with black. 
and now I'm going to select my depth here and with Ctrl Shift Alt click I'm going to only retain the foreground part of the selection and now if I'm getting back to this one I can fill it Trying to do this right, I think this is okay. Let's see foreground. I'm going to invert the values for my foreground. Limit the range. Yeah, slowly we are getting there. I'm going to invert the selection, and same here. I'm going to fix the range in the background. Okay. Cool. So now, you know, with just a few tweaks, the selection and my initial depth map, I have a pretty accurate, it's not completely accurate, there are still painting edges that are missing, painted edges, but anyway, it is roughly giving me a precious information, which is a depth map. Here it is, the one I did, which is a lot cleaner. And to delete that one, I simply spent more time to fix it. This is why it is cleaner. And thanks to, the, to this map, now it's very easy to come in here, copy merge everything. Okay. Well, it's, this is just for the purpose of the demonstration. So just to show you how, we, how you can get easily an interesting depth of field and with um, blur lens blur now you can simply select as a source the um, actual channel that you created and it's going to do all the job for us so let's say for example i want the focus to be on that work you know because work are absolutely awesome and this is my main subject so now my main focus is the rock and in front and behind it's going to slowly blur things. Now let's say I really want my focus to be on that background here. So I, you can see it's going to blur more and more following this simple depth map. But my purpose was, was to have that character completely out of any blur and slowly having a blur that would apply uh, towards the, the, in the in following the z-depth. So this is what I did. Mm -hmm. Strange. Oh yeah. So I simply painted out some of the edges that I I had um, painted by hand previously, like for example the teeth, the hair, and so on. So the um, thing here. Sorry, sometimes I don't, I don't know the word in English, so but uh, I see. I think you see what I mean. Okay. Again, micro composition, just fixing fixing the jaw, so we can better understand what this is. Same thing for the eye. I'm completely exaggerating the uh, the eye because I I want this shape. It's not a conventional sh fish, so. It can be difficult to, to understand what this is. So this is why I want to exaggerate some of the features that really help to understand what this character is. Yeah, so I'm adding a bit of subsurface scattering that goes through the um, through this part of the fish. A bit of painterliness just to integrate everything together. Yeah, desaturating some part of the board because it, it was looking like too 
homogeneously saturated, which doesn't look right at all for a normal board. Yeah, some more, a bit more of a texture. So here it's not a texture actually, it's a, it's a Kobe merge of everything and a high pass. So it's, it's a simple trick to bring back some sharpening. And it's actually very, very strong. But my idea was, because I was going for this kind of depth of field look, I just wanted to make sure that this fish would, would feel like, and the, the, the child too, would feel more closer to us. As you can see here, same. Okay. A bit of paint over again. I think here it's uh, it was. It's just fixing those values at the bottom. Same again, it was attracting too much the attention. Again, double. And now what I did, and this is something I just discovered using it, the the uh, the glow, the depth of fail feature, but I realized that this depth of fail feature had a very interesting way of uh, of selecting part of the image that that have a high specular value and that create an interesting glow which is more a bit more accidental than a simple blur. So I wanted to combine this with my current my current glow. So with everything in place, you can see that it really brings that very small touch of, of glowing, of light bloom that suggests that there is like a super large amount of sun that is hitting this different part of the image. Here it is. Done. Here's a version with the post processing. So again, it's 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 very subtle. Let me open this to show you what kind of uh, operation I did. And I believe it's simply a grain and probably a bit of sharpening and a bit of noise reduction. So. If I'm iterating between both, before, after, before, after, you can see it's it's very subtle. Once again, each of these operations, when they add up one to another, they really help to constrict, to slowly build up the image towards something that is, yeah, you know, just just more subtle. If you use just one super strong. Uh, sharpening all over the place. It's generally it's it really shows. So a bit of sharpening, just a slight, slightly touch of blur, and this type of noise. And this time this is a global noise, which is everywhere. And this noise, what what I really like about this uh, camera roll noise, is that it it tends to blend everything together. I mean, I could completely just remove, you know, just the luminance and the sharpening, just so you see what it does. I, I don't know if you are able to see this in the recording, because maybe the artifact of the recording, they are already doing this type of noise blending. But here I can definitely see this small pixel of the Gaussian blur, of the Gaussian noise I added previously. You can clearly see like some blue shift, red shift, and green shift. And with this just small amount of noise here, it's blending everything together. And it creates kind of a, of a unified uh, noise on top of everything. I'm going to cancel this. And I just want to reopen it again to show you the two other settings. 
So let's remove that noise now and just concentrate. Yeah, this is the only settings I have. Just concentrate on what these other settings are doing. So luminance, we are 12. Luminance is really interesting because it's going to also simplify some part of the image based on a, an algorithm that I think, I believe, detect uh, the proximity of, uh, of details one to another. So if I'm forcing this like up to 100, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but it's really creating like this super soft, smooth look. And I think if I'm bringing back to zero, you can see the difference. So I know that all the previous noising work I've done on top of everything, it is going to be slightly tempered by, by this last uh, post-processing trick. And at the contrary, the sharpening here, if I'm re removing the sharpening, and what it does, it creates like a very slight subtle uh, line around each of the most contrasted shapes. And this masking here feature is super important because without it, it's going to emphasize each and every kind of small contrast. So it's going to basically build up on top of the noise I created before. And, and really, it's, it, it's not what I want to go for. It's, now it's super noisy. But if you use this masking threshold, it's going to behave a bit like the noise reduction. Try to detect which um, shapes have the more contrast one to with another and it's going to only apply this sharpening uh, at the at this moment so without with so as you can see it doesn't change the background too much it it had a bit of teeth on the background but not that much but it is mainly helping is sharpen in sharpening the uh, this main subject Cancel. So, with, without. Okay, here it is. 